Welcome to the Zanbergen Report, where wealth strategies and pop culture collide. Featuring your distinguished host and certified financial planner, Bart Zandbergen. Welcome to our show of dream chasers and wealth makers. We are thrilled to be back in the studio today with a new episode of the Zanbergen Report. I'm proud to bring in the movers, shakers, and difference makers who are passionate about what they have learned and what you need to know today. And today I'm very pleased to have in studio Scott Heinle and Nick Bernadowitz from Producers Choice Network, strategic, strategic partners of the Zambergen Group. Welcome, guys. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Sure. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> and thanks for hosting or letting us use your studio. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the more, the merrier. All right. Let's talk about something um, that has been an important part of, of all of our practices and the people that we work with, which is retirement income. Mm. Right? Slightly important for many. It, it comes up from time to time in, <laughs> in the financial world, financial planning. You know, the funny thing, a lot of, a lot of uh, retirees don't even think about that part. They think about growing this, but what are they going to do when they retire? How are they going to turn that into usable yeah. things? So. so the old adage that we know, and I, I think maybe the general public doesn't know, that most people spend more time each year planning a one-week vacation than they do planning their 20, 30, 40, 50 year retirement, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. I've seen that billboard before. <laughs> All right. So let's first of all talk about, you know, what is retirement income planning? So Nick, what would you say is, is what it is and, and obviously why it's so important? Yeah. You know, everybody thinks about the accumulation phase, the growing of retirement funds, protecting that, ensuring that they make their nest egg as large and as bulletproof as possible coming into retirement. But upon retirement, you no longer have many income sources other than social security or a pension or something along those lines. So now you got to start utilizing those assets as a stream of income to cover your basic expenses along with discretionary spending. Right. I call it the goose, right? The goose that lays the golden egg. Absolutely. And one of the, you know, comparisons I like to use in helping kind of shape the perspective is for I mean, how many years am I in my working years and focusing on deferment, right? Making contributions to 401ks, IRAs, my building my investment portfolio starts maybe when I'm in my mid twenties, maybe late, maybe early thirties at the earliest upwards of 50 to 65 years of age, yeah. depending on my profession, how much I earned many, many factors that play into that. But you're talking about a 30 plus year accumulation phase. In the world of medicine, when I'm an infant or a child, what kind of a doctor do I go to? I go to a pediatrician. Specialist. Why? Because they, exactly. Yeah. So I, I like to use that comparison because I just think it, it kind of humanly relates to the fact that in my early years, I, I work with a pediatrician. Then I have a general practitioner when I'm basically fully developed, I'm healthy, I'm living my normal natural life, hopefully. And so I only really need to to meet with a practitioner or a doctor when and if something is an issue. The general financial advisor, you know, uh, helping with my investments, help with accumulation. It isn't until I start to transition and we say this is five years prior to retirement and really five to 10 years post-retirement where the paradigm shifts into not so much about accumulation of assets, but the shifting of how do I efficiently and effectively decumulate my assets and a number of factors come into play there. Uh, the products, the solutions, the taxation, the risk. There's a number of items that have to be viewed uh, when we're shifting from uh, accumulation to decumulation. Right, right. And, you know, we talk about specifically retirement. And I, I think another word that, that we've used recently, mostly because we've had clients that fall in this category, it's really financial independence. Because most of us, when we think of retirement, to your point, we've worked 20, 30, 40 years, not 20, 30 or 40 years, we're 65 or 70, we're going to retire. But what about the group of people who have had a liquidation event of some sort? They've sold their company. Maybe they're in their 40s or 50s, and now they have a, a the goose, mm -hmm. right? And they can technically not work. They can work if they want. They can do something different. They can do something philanthropic, but they still, they're in the same situation where now they have this, 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 this asset or assets that they need to protect and create an income for. And w within 
each of those individuals, regardless of net worth, they all have unique needs and strategies that need to be implemented. Using the medical analogy, just like as I age, I have different impairments. I have different specialists that I need to go to. So as an example, high income earners are going to be significantly more sensitive to taxes right. and how to efficiently distribute income and create an income stream that's tax efficient. You know, if I'm not quote unquote high net worth, define what that is, then it's less about taxes as much as it is procuring the fact that I'm going to receive an income for the rest of my life in a retirement that might last 30 plus years, right? Right, right. Yeah, I always make the joke when I'm dealing with clients that, you know, a higher net worth is is just more zeros. Same issues, <laughs> same deaccumulation stories. Yeah. Yes, a little more focus on taxes, but their risks are the same, right? It, it's the same story, just add a couple more zeros to the, the number. You know, that's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> All right. So when, when we do planning, we ultimately come up with what we call a family index. And that family index is, and it depends on where we are in the phase, but if it's accumulation phase, you know, what kind of return do we need to reach for so that you're properly prepared once retirement comes? Mm -hmm. Once you're in financial independence or retirement phase, then the family index may or may not change, but what sort of income are we shooting for so that your assets will be there for the rest of your life? Mm. And as we all know, clients have different objectives with their, with their resources or their assets. Most of them want their assets to continue, to have, if they can, a legacy to leave to their family. Um, at the very, very least, be there should they outlive their, their actuarial life. Yeah. So you don't want to undershoot that. Of course. Um, there is a very small group, and I have one set of clients going through right now. They have no children, retired teachers, actually. And their plan is, and this is kind of a, an old joke in our industry, too, that the last check they write is to the mortuary, and it bounces. And so they're, they're on a plan right now. Now, I have not coached them on what age to use. I've asked them to add 10 years to whatever. <laughs> That's always the problem with that, yeah, right? Trying right. to pinpoint, okay, when are you going to pass away? Yeah. When's that magic number? So I think one of the points, and Scott, you kind of hit it earlier too. So this family index is going to be different for Nick, Scott, and for me, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is different. Everyone has different circumstances. So things that we talk about, I think in general, in theme, may work for most people, but in specifics, it's going to, to vary. And that's a perfect example of the expertise. I would say the specific expertise and professionalism that you provide clients or any wealth manager or planner that has this expertise to deal with that. It, it's critically important as opposed to, you know, this do it yourself model. Yeah, I take that as a, as a compliment. So I'll, I'll take it and thank you. And, yes. and I do think it's very important. And, yeah. and it's something that you don't just set and walk away from either because circumstances change. We may have a couple of, you know, amazing you know, overall return years. We may have some, not so much a family can go through some catastrophe um, that has caused their assets to be diminished. Try uh, catching a handful of, uh, you know, of water pouring out of a bucket. You just can't do it. That's right. right? That's right. So while that family index might be different for most, I mean, there is a, a rule of thumb kind of in the industry for retirement planning. And I want to get into, I know you guys have a great idea on different buckets, but at the very, very least, you want to spread between what you're taking out for income as a percentage and what your portfolio is earning. Mm -hmm. So if we use this as an example, again, only an example, if someone were to live off of 3% of their portfolio and the portfolio grows at five, there's a net 2% gain on average in the portfolio, which gives this family a 2% cost of living increase each year mm -hmm. as their portfolio growth. That's kind of a perfect world scenario, but I, I think it's a, a nice milestone to shoot for. Um, and again, that's one of many, and that index, maybe for others, you know, it's three, maybe it's four, it's five, but that, I think we're in the ballpark. What kind of a, um, you know, safe withdrawal rate are you seeing within your practice and clients' portfolios? I mean, th there's tons of content out there, the 4%, this, that, and the other, but I do find that within a given practices, that needle moves. Right. Know? For us, it's really unique to the to each individual. Um, I shoot for three. You do? I, I'll lead with three. Right. Um, I think that's a, um, a comfortable goal to three and, and to not exceed. With an inflationary adjustment. Correct. Yeah. Okay. 
Right. The safe the safe withdrawal rule was designed as you know four percent. Everybody hears the four percent number, and yeah. what that was was really four percent for thirty years, assuming you know average returns is how that was designed. Where you spend everything at the end of the thirtieth year. Um, people are living longer than 30 years in retirement. So that's where the four doesn't quite work and why a, a three is a realistic number with with the inflation hedge built in. Yeah. That adjusted, I don't know, in the last 12 months, 18 months, mm-hmm. where that four maybe went down to three. Yeah. As a rule, if um, just part of my makeup, if I'm going to make an error, I'd rather make an error on the side of conservative. So I've, I've always tried to go on, the, on that lower side. Amen to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the last thing a client w- wants is to run out of money. That That is. Well, right? That is the whole point. Yep. That is the whole point. So we have the safe withdrawal. And then Nick, talk to us about the, the bucket approach. Yeah. So there's various bucket approaches that advisors will use. Um, one being, let's, let's break up our retirement you know, time horizon into buckets. Our first five to 10 years is going to be bucket one. And we're going to put assets and income sources within that bucket that are going to fill the gap during that time. Bucket two, right, will be in a longer term duration investment or or vehicle that would then fill the gap from year 10 to 20 and then so on in bucket three. And the goal is each bucket gets fully liquidated within that duration. So that's your income gap. And the theory or idea behind that is that you can have more aggressive growth vehicles in the bucket two and three because you're not going to need them for 10 years. And you can be more conservative on your short-term buckets, your fixed income buckets, just to cover that initial gap. Mm-hmm. And so that would be like a generic bucket strategy. And then there's other strategies of this is going to be my income bucket only, right? This is my fixed income bucket. And then I have my equity side. So there's different approaches to it. Um, it, it as you said, it really becomes client specific on, on risk tolerance, on right. income projections, income goals. Yeah. Uh, what I'll add to the to that bucket approach, especially like in phase one, what we're finding when, is when clients first come kind of come out of the gate of retirement, um, obviously they're younger than they are five or 10 years from now. That's obvious. So many of them will like, we're going to travel, we're going to golf more, we're going to do all these things, mm-hmm. right? So for the first five or 10 years, we try to plan and accommodate for where old school is once you retire, your living expenses are what, 60% of what it was while you were working. Right. We keep it at 100 <laughs> for the first for the five first. years plus. Again, given the, the client and given their circumstances. Right. Because this is a, it's like brand new for them, right? Not that they haven't traveled, but they don't have to show up anywhere. So they have more trips, more, they're spending more money. But what we've also found, at least what I've found through experience of all these years, is five or 10 years of that. And most people are like, okay, been there, done that. Don't need to do anymore. I'm pretty happy with you know at home, so um, that would fall. Yeah, closer. credit credit where credit is due here. Um, one of our industry experts that that is well researched, well known advocate for creating income in retirement and having structured income. His name is Tom Hegna, and he gives two um, quotes, if you will, relative to exactly what you just said. There's three phases of retirement. One the go-go years, two, (laughs) the slow go years, and three, the no-go years. So the first five to 10 years is the go-go. That's every day is a Saturday because I'm no longer reporting in (laughs) another quote of his. Um, And it's so true. You know, I'm traveling, I'm golfing. We're doing all of these things that we've been waiting to do for a number of years. And then we transition into phase two, which is things start to slow down a little bit. We got that out of our system. So the bucket approach, regardless of how you asset allocate, it's more of a structure of duration, right? That helps. That's the foundation of that strategy. And there's no right or wrong. The key to this, family index, following a process, what's the right strategy to deploy for those given clients? Right, right. Couldn't agree more. Go, go. Go, go years. Into the go, go years. That's (laughs) right. So let's switch gears a little bit. Um, Let's talk about the different kind of forms of retiring income. There's terms that people have heard, I'm sure, throughout their life, Roth IRA, IRA, annuity. Um, We'll get to eventually Social Security. Um, Scott, you want to kind of start the conversation on that? Yeah, so 
with any income plan, we start with the, the, the sources of income I know I am going to rely on. Social Security is number one of that. Uh, then it comes down to the individual asset classes that we do have. All are not created equal. So a proper retirement income plan takes into context the taxation and the asset allocation of those investments accordingly. Because the idea is we want to distribute the assets as efficiently as we can, but also looking at it very closely from a taxable standpoint. So uh, Roth IRA assets we know are tax-free on distributions. Any true qualified, whether that's a simple IRA, SEP IRA, 401k, things like this, they're going to be fully taxable as income in retirement. And then if I have any after-tax accounts, brokerage accounts, things like this, you have to look under the hood there again to find out, okay, what's the makeup of this account and how's the taxation treated? Is it individual stocks that receives, you know, a step up on a step up in basis upon death? And so we want to be very, very aware and sensitive to all of that as we plan for income. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And part of our planning process, as we look at um, clients, you know, more on an annual basis, what taxes look like. And so how much can, should we take out of Roth IRA so as not to kick up a tax bracket from their taxable accounts? And, you know, depending on the age, they may have a required minimum distribution from their qualified plan. So we know where we have a certain hurdle, right, of, mm. of taxable income. And then how much income can we, how much more taxable income can we incur without kicking up to the next tax bracket? So there is obviously some, some planning that goes involved there. So now it's important to add in the conversation of annuities. Mm -hmm. Well, what is this word annuity? There's plenty of content that exists out on the World Wide Web. You can Google it. There's plenty of information about it, positive and negative, right? Sure. But let's just look at it from a, a planning standpoint. So annuities provide wonderful benefits to clients. What is that benefit? The ability to receive a guaranteed lifetime income that I cannot outlive. We're not talking about rate of return. We're not talking about anything else other than fundamentally, if I have a major concern that I want to guarantee X amount a month of income and Social Security, if that's the only source of income that I can truly rely on for the rest of my life, isn't going to get me there, then annuities may provide that peace of mind income stream that I cannot outlive. And there's a number of ways that we can accomplish that through single premium immediate annuities, through deferred income annuities, or through deferred annuities with these guaranteed income riders that we can add to them. So, you know, there's a lot of solutions that these products provide to consumers looking to structure a guaranteed income. Our take is, is really to create this kind of floor. You know, ask the client, you know, what is that, you know, I quote unquote, Didn't gots you? to have income in yeah. retirement. That's, yeah. we can utilize these products as a wonderful benchmark or a floor so that that's a, that's an element of your retirement we no longer have to worry about. What? And it creates additional, uh, let me finish and then you can add in, it creates additional freedoms for the rest of the assets in the portfolio that we can maybe take more risk on. We can do other things with those assets because I'm not necessarily resting on the fact that I'm gonna to have to distribute that in requirement as a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all I was gonna add is what a lot of people don't realize is that Social Security is one of the greatest annuities you've ever bought. It provides a guaranteed income stream mm -hmm. with a guaranteed cost of living adjustment throughout your lifetime for you and your spouse. Yeah. It is an annuity, it's no different at its core. Same with any private pension that a company is going to pay you. It is an income stream generated annuity. That's all it is. Yeah. And, and everybody hears the buzzword annuity and they get the icky feeling because they, they think of different types of annuity, not a core of what it does for planning and income planning. I think it's important to make sure we had, I think we need to bring it down one level. We, we talked about annuities. We went right into the income component, which is great, mm. but, it, but let's just bring it down a notch to define, you know, what an annuity it is. Mm. So an annuity is issued by an insurance company. Correct. It's a form of, of, um, asset in, in its core, a form of asset accumulation. It does uh, provide deferred tax growth, meaning you would invest some money that's after-tax money for the most part, as long as you don't put in a qualified plan. 
it grows. You pay no taxes on any of the interest earned. You pay taxes on the money coming out. So Scott, what you guys have just defined, which is a great component, but again, not all annuities are created equal. So mm -hmm. some annuities have the income rider, some don't. So it's 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 a matter of making sure the annuity you either you add it to it and or it's one that's bundled with. The world of annuities is very vast. Let me be very clear. Hundred percent. There are hundreds and hundreds of annuity products that exist on the marketplace today. Just like there are mutual funds, ETFs, stocks. I can go on and on. Right. This is where proper planning becomes very important. What is it that I'm utilizing an annuity for? You've described one of the foundational benefits of an annuity, which is the deferment or the safe alternative that they provide for safe accumulation backed by an insurance company. And so that's just the, the main benefits that they provide from a growth and a tax deferred standpoint. Uh, they can also on the flip side provide income solutions that are efficient and guaranteed. So again, based on the hundreds of products that exist in the marketplace today, what are we wanting this asset class to provide? Right. Right. And again, I think it goes down to everyone is unique. Everyone is individual, you know, um, risk tolerance, you know, um, to me, someone with a lower risk tolerance may be more apt to have maybe more money in an annuity, if any at all. Correct. Which, uh, just because of the safety factor. Yep. So it it's, is foundational. I like that. So some, um, you know, down on the, on the lower spec, uh, risk spectrum. So absolutely. It serves that very well. Fixed. So on, on, on the kind of investment continuum, you know, in the world of annuities on the left, left, the more conservative end, you're going to have fixed annuities and fixed indexed annuities. And then as I, as I move towards the right, now you're shifting from, you know, guaranteed interest products or no, no market risk solutions backed by the full faith and credit of the underlying insurance company towards that of these variable annuity contracts that are registered. There are securities, there are investments, and they are uh, invested within mutual funds and sub accounts, right? That the the policyholder is accepting some level of risk. Subject to risk. That's right. Correct. Right. It's just another tool in the tool belt. Yeah. You know, building the retirement income plan. It's it's just another thing that can right. slot in to help the overall plan. It, it's not the end all be all, but it it, it is a tool. It's just like a bond is going to be a tool. Just like you know a, a, a pension. Just all the above. Yeah, and actually, I was going to start kind of going through the different um, income options. So under fixed income, you have bonds, either corporate or, or government and then municipal. So that's considered a retirement, for many people, a retirement income source. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you have CDs, you have cash, and then annuities, I think, in, in that same area. So um, I will say, as we begin to move on, annuities... To Scott's point, are vast. There are many. Just make sure you ask your advisor, work with someone who is a trusted uh, advisor, and make sure that you're um, checking under the hood and make sure it's the it's the right thing for you. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about risks that um, one who is entering retirement are facing. Like I'll start with one: longevity risk. Longevity risk. As we said, people are living longer. Um, life expectancy tables are increasing pretty much every year, it seems like. Yeah. So it's no longer, you know, the, the 70s, you're passing away. It's, it's late 80s, early 90s. In a couple, there's an 80% chance one of you are going to live. If you've made it to 70, you're going to live well into your 90s. So it, it, the longevity risk is huge, outliving the assets within the portfolio, you know, targeting a 30, 25 to 30 year you know, de-accumulation phase of a portfolio, now you live 40 years, well, there was some additional planning that needed to be done within, right, right. throughout the years. And so that is a major risk, and we need that built in. We need that contingency plan, what if? That yeah. is one. Yeah, that certain has increased over time. I mean, we all know back in when Social Security was even invented, if you will, uh, the average retirement span was only about five years, if even that. People were dying, you know, retiring at 60, dying at 65. So we've yeah. come a long way. Yeah, medical advancements plays a huge part in that. And it, it, it's it's a legitimate real risk that retirees face, regardless of your net worth, because uh, the more assets I have, typically the more my burn rate will be. I mean, in other words, my expense yeah. need is going to be greater, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, inflation risk would be another one. Yeah. This is in the news this week. 
Yeah. Right. The markets have taken it on the chin a little bit because of the creeping in or the concern that inflation is going to be coming in. I mean, look, let's let's face it. If if the U.S. is printing billions and billions of dollars and circulating that to help prop prop up this this economy, uh, what's the ramification of that? And when? Right. We've been at historically low inflation for so long. Um, it's, it's sure it's just a matter of time. Um, I wasn't expecting it to be now, but we don't know. We'll see. Who knows? But it is a risk. It's a risk. It's, it's Absolutely. something we need to accommodate for. And what That's that means right. is if inflation's at 2%, you want to make sure that after your expenses, your investments grow at least 2%. Correct. You want, you want the power of your dollar to hopefully stay at least net zero, right? Right. Another one would be excess, excess withdrawal risk for many individuals, you know, depending on how close I am to that withdrawal rate. If I'm moving the needle from three to four or four to five, let's just say as a withdrawal rate. And look, let's face it, we all have emergencies and unexpected needs um, for whatever it may be. Well, if those are big ticket items relative to the size of my portfolio, that could have a dramatic impact on the longevity and you know the residual value of the portfolio. And sadly, timing too. To need a, an excess withdrawal during a you know thirty percent market downturn, that um, um, it becomes so critical. Yeah. You know, and that that's where it leads right next into, w- which is where we are regularly advocating for structured annuity income because of the next risk, which is sequence of returns risk. Look, if I retire at the you know the exact wrong time in terms of market returns. That'll have a dramatic effect. I mean, devastating effect on the longevity of the portfolio. So one of the things that we do, and if you Google this sequence of returns risk, you'll see many charts that'll show, let's just say a 20 year projection of returns, completely random. And the first two or three years are negative. So defined by the exact wrong time. Right. And same withdrawal. Right, so maybe it's a three percent withdrawal rate with a built-in conservative inflationary increase over time, and then portfolio B, so the subsequent ledger, is exactly the same returns, but in reversed order. So the first three years are not negative; they're positive. The three negative are at the very end, and the difference in portfolio values at the end of that twenty-year period that I just described, same withdrawals, same returns, just inverse in order, is you know you'll have tens of thousands of dollars in your portfolio in this example versus seven figures in value in the portfolio. So that is clear evidence of the fact that sequence of returns is a huge risk for many retirees. And what are you doing to mitigate it? Right. Right. Good point. Let's talk about long-term care risk. We could go on and on about <laughs> this show by itself. Well, we've done a few shows on this, so we won't belabor this, but I'll say it in one sentence and we can move on. This is clearly the largest unfunded risk facing retirees today. You either have a plan for it or you don't. A plan does not mean you have to own insurance. Not at all. Right. We advocate for it because it's it's leverage of dollars efficiently and it's tax-free if I use it for LTC. So that makes a lot of sense in many ways. Some is better than none. So there's my tidbit on that. Uh, but clearly, there's no faster way to completely erode a portfolio than if a family is hit with a need for care. Yeah. Long-term uh, care. Let me let me add this. It, it's the one risk that we've discussed thus far that is a compounding risk to the other ones we just said. Sequence of returns, excess withdrawal risk. All of these, longevity, the longer you live, the more burn rate you have with long-term care because it's going to increase your expense need instantly for multiple years. Your withdrawal rate is going to be higher than what you had expected. So it's 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 a compounding risk. It's pouring gasoline on the fire. Sure, mm. I do have to commend you both. That's probably the shortest response to a long term care <laughs> question I've ever heard you guys answer. We're so getting better. Well done, <laughs> biting the tongue. <laughs> yeah. uh, All right, we're we're near the end. So uh, loss of spouse risk, Nick. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people don't don't think about the income 
right? That they might be generating off of spouse social security. That might be a source of income they rely on within pension. the portfolio. Pension. If they had a single life pension, yeah. they didn't do a pen max design um, with life insurance. Not accounting for a loss um, is, is something people do face. If, if they're working with an advisor like yourself that has all that laid out, then probably have the what if scenarios upon if one passes or the other, um, people can can fall into a trap. Yeah. Not to mention the income tax matrix changes if I'm filing a single versus married, mm-hmm. right? So depending on my financial situation, that tax matrix adjustment, if you will, could be pretty substantial. Yeah, yeah. Here's one I don't see on the list very often, but um, elder abuse risk. We know that elder abuse is out there. How do you define it as a risk for retirement? Yeah, uh, it's it's one you don't want to think um, because it's 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 sad to think that you're you might be at the risk of having a family member, a loved one, a friend take advantage of you, or if you don't have those things, having an outside person take advantage of you. Uh, we call it a risk for retirement and retirement income because you can have a person that's that's skimming off the top, that's bleeding you dry through assets mm. that you don't even know. Um, especially if they're the ones controlling, handling financial assets, financial decisions, if you're in a home, these type of things, it, it, it does become a major risk. And in most cases, let me be clear, it, it is a person within the trusted network of the client yeah. we're, we're helping manage their, their assets. Yeah. I've seen it. Uh, you know, I, I, I would make, I would go out and say this is growing at, you know, almost like an epidemic pace, case, uh, pace, if you will, excuse me. Mm-hmm. So there's where you have increased regulations around uh, trust planning and power of attorneys. We're yeah. not, in, we're, we are not attorneys, but right. uh, we know enough to know that, you know, these, these um, rules are changing quickly right. to help protect this from happening. So that's right. a good thing. So we've covered a lot and we've run out of time. So I just, I think I'd like to close by summarizing. There is a lot when it comes to retirement income. Mm. It does require planning more than your annual two week vacation. Work with a trusted advisor and make sure you cover all the risks and have your your different income buckets uh, ready to go. Confide in the expert. Right, right. Agreed. Have a plan. The plan, the plan is the most important thing. It's, it's not just take your, your portfolio and apply withdrawal to it. Have, have a structured yeah. plan, work with a trusted advisor. Very good. Gentlemen, it's been great having you in studio today. Thanks mm. for your knowledge, expertise, wit, and everything else that comes with it. Appreciate it. So you've heard the show before. You've been on the show before, and you know I have my final thought question. Mm. Scott's I trying forgot to remember about what this, that is. I, I do. <laughs> So I'll let either of you answer. We'll see if you come up with the same answer. Okay. Um, it shouldn't be the same. Uh, what would you say is your ultimate lesson learned as your career in the financial services industry? So one I'll part with today is don't let your emotions when it comes to dealing with finances take the better of, get the better of you. Keep emotions out of it. Keep yourself in a, is, as even keel as you possibly can. And this is where you really need to do some soul searching because I would argue most people can't do that on their own when they're talking about their assets. So there's where it becomes critically important to confide in somebody else that isn't going to take the same emotional lens with their finances and retirement. Um, you've got to disconnect yourself from that. Yeah, good. That's a good one. So my final, final question is all three of us here are lovers of the juice. Mm, <laughs> we are. So tell me the last best glass or bottle of wine that you had. Oh, gosh. So I was at a friends of ours. <laughs> and these are those friends, right, who are like in all the wine clubs. And after things are, you know, a little <laughs> loose, starts pulling them all out. And I was texting you. I was showing him the images. There was chimney rock in there. There was um, Sil- uh, Silver Oak, Silver Oak, uh, Napa Valley, you know. So Camus, uh, you brought out it was it was Camus. It was a yeah. trifecta, not of your you know preferred yeah. juice. Yeah, they were all cabs yeah. or Cab Franc. Yeah, but they were wonderful bottles of wine. So my last real indulge was a really good time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
finish oh. on that note. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a good night just vicariously living through you. Yeah, it was That's good. Sure. So how about you, Nick? Mine was a Maris um, or Maroos uh, Napa right. Valley Cab uh, yeah. 2012. Um, we just opened it for our anniversary, so yeah. it, it was fantastic. fantastic. And we are down at Doheny, sunset, perfect. Yeah. It was perfect. Yep. Beautiful. Nice. Yes. What about you? So mine was recently going through my home cellar and um, it, completely opposite direction to you guys. I went white. It was, it's was it been somewhat warm, so I go, I'm going, I haven't had a Chardonnay in a while. And I found a 2014 Benediction Chardonnay um, from Sonoma. It was It was amazing. Wow. Yeah, the last white, well, it was a rosé, because my wife has gotten so off of reds. She'll only pretty much drink rosé now. Yeah. And it's one of our favorites, rosé, which is from a New Zealand winery, yeah. that we will have you, we will, one All day, right. we will take you there on a helicopter. <laughs> there we Art go. likes yeah. his whites and bubbles. The whites and bubbles, right? I appreciate that. <laughs> yep, yep. It's not lost on me, that's for sure. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks again for your time. Thanks for everyone who has tuned in. We look forward to being in studio again next week. Cheers. Tune in next week for the latest edition of the Zanbergen Report, Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Catch up on our recent shows by visiting podcast.bartzanbergen.com. The Zanbergen Report is also available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Interested in being a featured guest on our show or have a question you'd like to hear us answer? Email podcast at bartzanbergen.com. The contents of this podcast episode do not constitute an offer of securities or a solicitation of an offer to buy securities and may not be relied upon in making an investment decision related to any investment offering Access Wealth Management LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. Access does not warrant the accuracy or completeness of the information contained herein. Opinions are our current opinions and are subject to change without notice. Prices, quotes, rates are subject to change without notice. Generally, investments are not FDIC insured, not bank guaranteed and may lose value. Brokerage services are offered through to Sarah Capital, member FINRA.